Over the years, we have connected billions of people. We have laid the foundation for innovation and growth, and we have brought it everywhere. But this time, it's different. Now, our IoT, 5G, and automation technology stands ready to unlock a wave of new value. We're talking operating rooms connected across oceans, trucks communicating to increase efficiency, and factory floors going fully digital. We'll see waste reduced, accidents dramatically decrease, and remarkable new business models come to life. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. To make this a reality, we're on a quest. To make technology easy to use, adopt, and scale. To build an ecosystem together with our customers where change is easy, where standards are global, and where the full value of connectivity can be realized faster than ever. Getting to easy won't be easy, but we're determined to lead the way, to move fast, to knock down barriers, and to cut through complexity. Join us. Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Mats Carlson from Ericsson. He's the head of uh, R&D portfolio and digital services at Ericsson. So Mats, please welcome. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, I think it's a good, good session with the Open Network and Summit and what the Linux Foundation has done. Um, Quest for Easy. Uh, I think one of the reasons why, why we started with Quest for Easy because I think that is very much the reason why I go to work. I think where, why you go to work. I think we're all making, trying to make things simpler. I mean, we're trying to make a software stack simpler to kind of use. We're trying to make our products and services simpler to use, quicker to deploy. Everything should be quicker, easier, and simpler. Uh, I will be joined a bit later with, uh, with uh, Verizon, but I will start with actually talking about 5G, not as a radio standard. I think there was a lot of radio in, in, the, in the video, but very much as 5G as a platform for innovation. Uh, where is the clicker here? Yeah. And also talk about the role of open source. Uh, when we're actually building the 5G networks. I mean, uh, telecom has been used to do proprietary boxes. That is not the, how it works going forward now. So really about also the role of open source and the community as the driving force for building the, the future networks. So what is the difference between 5G and what we have done before? I mean, all the telecom networks that we have done historically, like 2D, 3D, they have more or less been focused on only providing two basic services, voice and data. What is then the difference between 5G? 5G is completely use case driven. That means that we don't really know what services the 5G network will need to provide. Of course, there will still be a need to provide the basic data service, et cetera. But a lot of the new services coming in, they are not kind of, they are developed outside the network. Of course, 5G is also a technology leap. We are developing new radios. We are developing a new core. But what we're also now doing is that how are we going to use the networks? How are we going to monetize the network? How do we actually make sure that we have networks that are fit for the purpose, for the use case or the services that we are using? So the network needs to have the capability to supply multiple use cases. And each use case is may have completely different characteristics need in terms of latency, in terms of bandwidth, in terms of cost points you need to hit for that specific service. We also need to be able to have multiple monetization path. Business to consumer is, of course, very much what we are doing today, but business to business, business to business to consumers. Uh, and of course, we need to be able to create and deploy services 
in hours and minutes and not maybe months or weeks or years even. And of course, all this supported by a zero touch operational model. We usually divide the five use cases in what we call massive machine type communication, critical machine type communication, and enhanced mobile broadband. So if you look at massive machine type communication, that is a lot of that we can already do today with the current radio standards. But that is typically like a smart meters, logistic, asset tracking, fleet management. Very much driven by low cost, low energy, small data volumes, massive numbers. I mean, to look on some of the like, small data, I mean, if you, for instance, have a birdie alarm, most cases it doesn't send any data at all, but when it needs to send the data, it better work. Then on the other side, we have the critical machine type communication. Now here is more like industrial use cases, industrial robots, remote control, haptic control. I mean, this could be like requiring extremely high reliability, extremely low latency, and of course, uh, at an extremely high availability. On the bottom, we have the more or less the existing business that we are today, but of course, with the enhanced mobile broadband, when bandwidth is increasing, when latency is going down, of course, we can support much more like 4K, 8K video, augmented reality, etc. when we're having applications that are much more um, kind of latency critical than, than the current application. Of course, when the latency is going down, from like maybe 30 milliseconds on the, on the axis down to like two milliseconds on the axis. Then of course a lot of new cases opens up. But of course we're talking very much about 5G, but of course the radio 5G, that is rolling out more or less like next year or 2019, 2020. But a lot of the things that I'm discussing today, for instance, on the, on the massive machine type communication, that is already happening today and we are rebuilding the core network already today to cater for this type of new services. And of course, the opportunities are endless. Open source, I will come back to that one on, on, the, on the next slide, but when you're looking on the development of the infrastructure, you will kind of see how much different open source products that are needed to kind of build up this infrastructure. And also on the use case level, we talked about AI, machine learning, and apps using 5G and wireless connectivity. A lot of that ecosystem is also, of course, built around open source. And of course, for us, it's really about enabling the industries and the people to take the next step in the digital, digitalization journey. So 5G, it starts today, or it has already started. 5G requires a software-defined networking. It requires complete programmability of the networking. And of course, it starts already with like NFV and SDN, because we need to be able to have a flexibility in deployment of, of our uh, application. We need to have flexibility in actually adapting the network to, to the needs of the applications. And of course, going forward, going into cloud native and edge cloud. But we're also, of course, doing a lot of things also on the application side. For instance, splitting up the control plane and the user plane to be able to move out the user plane further out in the network uh, to do edge compute. But also have more like modernized applications like, and of course, going into microservices and container-based application. Management and orchestration, same thing. We need to break the silos that we have had in the OSS system, have a horizontalized, model-driven uh, management and orchestration, very much about what we are doing in ONAP. And of course, adding the machine learning and artificial intelligence to reach through automation and zero touch. It needs to be able to distribute workloads. We need to be able to put applications further and further out at the edge, but maybe also in some cases all the way out to the base stations. We also need to be able to have network separations, resilience, and isolation to be able to handle different type of uh, needs from the applications and the use cases. Network slices, very much we are discussing. Network slices is more or less the capability to create logical isolated network within the network that you can, for instance, have for specific services, you can have that an enterprise actually owns a specific slice within an operator network, or it can be done just to making sure that certain of your services are having the most optimal network infrastructure for that specific service. Of course, having the total cost of ownership for application lifecycle management, reduce time to market for the service creation and the service deployment, and of course, when you're looking at all this, you, you probably see that like a lot of these 
areas that bring up as the path to 5G is depending on uh, the role of the open source and the communities that we are, we are talking about here today at this conference. Uh, and of course for us it's really very much about like contributing, using and driving the development of a number of these open source uh, communities. So, another thing is that um, open source and standards, and standards I mean very much the classical, you call them sometimes paper standards, but um, Within uh, telecom, there is a need still for, I would call like paper standards like 3 d PP and Etsy. And the reason is that, that if you're going to build a 5D ecosystem with like billions of devices, it's pretty important that the interface between the device and the network is pretty stable because there is a huge ecosystem and investment. But on the other hand, there is also a need for, for increasing speed in innovation. And that is where open source comes in. So I think in 5G, I think this is really the first time now when we're actually combining these two forces into to one. So if we look at open source, open source, what does it bring to the table? Speed, it brings code. It brings a way that we actually work together in this room. It brings innovation, and it brings merit bias. Whatever is, is kind of what the best thing will kind of win, so to say. It's a bit of a Darwin's law. But there is also some drawback sometimes on open source. I mean, how do we make sure that we get better interoperability between the different open source products from a lifecycle management perspective? Uh, there is sometimes competition. There is a lot of open source product that is trying to solve the, the same thing. Uh, and I think this is, of course, what the Linux Foundation Network is trying as well, to kind of making sure that we can be better and, and quicker on that one. So standardization on the Hadan giving a lot of global scale. I mean, the reasons why your phone works across all over the world is very much about uh, what 3 dpp has done. It's focused on interfaces and functionality, and that, of course, give better interoperability. And of course, it provides a bit of a long-term outlook and backwards compatibility. So if we can do this in a very smart way, I think historically this has been a part. I think now we need to bring them together. And sometimes they've even been contending for the same spot. But if we do this good, I think one plus one can be bigger than two. So I firmly believe that these two groups need to work much, much closer together to kind of speed up that we're moving the industry quicker going forward. So, I would like them to introduce, we are working very close with Verizon on, on 5G here in North America. I think it's also very good, to, the sense of co collaboration, how we are working together. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce um, Mr. Anil Guntapalli, Executive Director of uh, Architectural Planning within Verizon. Welcome, Thanks. Anil. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Matt. And uh, it's really uh, great to be here. And last three days has been uh, revealing from a lot of exciting conversations. So thank you for the Linux Foundation uh, and team for organizing this as well. But uh, let me give you a perspective of what Verizon, uh, in the context of the 5G, as well as um, much more importantly, what the role of the open source is, and for us, how we are looking at that, and some of the challenges is, and the opportunities. Um, I mean, the, most, the perspective I want to paint today is that our customers are demanding experiences, which from our network, the ask from them is growing every day, right? I mean, they are asking for experiences which can be delivered by a network, which, is, which can be driven by whether it's 5G or it's stitched together with a network and connectivity fabric. It's, it's the core of, a, uh, core of our fabric, but much more importantly, what we are kind of enabling there is trying to deliver the services for our customers, which are new, which they have not experienced before, and they're, but they're asking for low latency services. Whether they're asking for 
you know, uh, use cases which are like V2X versus, you know, mobility experiences which they have not kind of experienced in the past, right? The way we are driving that is obviously in the core of this one is 5G. Uh, 5G enables low latency. 5G enables uh, ultra bandwidth, but we are also kind of driving that with uh, putting the fiber much more closer to the customers. But 5G also enables us to look at our network completely differently, right? Uh, in the, from the, we are transforming our network in the perspective of that. It gives us a way to take a step back, relook at that, and the, in the perspective of like laying out, you know, whether it is like uh, redoing the slicing of the network or building, enabling, um, pushing the compute much more closer to the customer because once you push the compute much more closer to the customers, we can enable services like, you know, uh, whether it's mixed reality, which demand like 10 to 20 milli, uh, milliseconds latency from the network, whether it's V2, V2X, which are much, much uh, lower latency uh, requirements. But underlying, underlining that is a fabric what we kind of fundamentally believe in three pillars in, within Verizon. It's, driven, it's software control, right? I mean, we drive with the software-defined networks. But much more importantly, we are focusing on closed-loop automation with cognitive fabric and putting AI up front in there. And then the other most important block is not an aftermath, but it's open source. The three main things what open source enables us for us is very selfishly, right, I think it takes the complexity out of the network. From the perspective, we spend a lot of the time, you know, looking at integrating the, the services, making sure they're working together, interoperability. That's where we spend time and we make sure that the network is up and running all the time. But then, if, if the standards are good and open source works uh, as it is, we can focus much more on driving what, uh, what our customer needs are, right? I mean, we want to take the cost out of the business. We want to focus on what uh, delivering the services on the, on the layers up, right? Again, for us, network OS is the, the core fundamental portion of it. It gives us the agility, uh, and it is driving the services what we, our customers are needing. But there is obviously some challenges with open source as we look at it, right? Uh, there's... I mean, we are participating in a lot of the groups, but as some of you would agree here, is that there's a lot of subgroups forming in pretty quickly, and there's very less time for us to focus on each one of these subgroups and to participate in it. I mean, our biggest uh, challenge is that, you know, I mean, it's like almost like a new shiny object that some of us are running to that one. What I ask and probably look at inwardly is that, you know, we. We should not, I mean, at least for us from this community is that you know, let's try to make sure and work together to make a buildable solution, right? I mean, let's get the reference architecture right. Let's get the blocks right. Make sure that is working before we move on to the next project. Um, again, as you, uh, whether it's a startup or a large vendor, I think everyone has resource constraints. Let's focus on the needs of the business. Again, going back to the previous uh, um, Conversation, it's like more about, I want to focus more on delivering the services rather than trying to fig, fix the interoperability issues and the other challenges in the network. And inwardly looking self-critical, right? I mean, we are trying to change our mindset as well that we want to move from one single accountability. We want to be multi-vendor. We want to encourage the ecosystem to collaborate and work together, and we're going to be right there with us. Again, it's a mind shift change, and we kind of embarked on that culture, and then we kind of investing in that, right? But some of these barriers about, you know, making sure that there's not too many sub-projects and there's interoperability, I think is, is, is I think it's, it's slowing us down. I think we need to get to a deployable solutions. Uh, I definitely ask this community for that help. And more, most importantly, what am I asking my vendor community here, right? I mean. Again, we're not here to drive, you know, basically it's not a, a race to zero, right? We want you to take the reference architectures and or the open source and innovate, but make it multi-vendor interoperable. Participate in that ecosystem, right? I mean, end of the day, whether it's a small vendor or a disruptive vendor startup, I think that's the notion what we, we model, what we would like to embrace as well, right? I mean. We want to make sure that you know it's it's 
compatible. It's at the same time, it is simple enough for me to put it in my network, and then I'm able to uh, expedite the introduction of the technologies, whether it's 5G versus any other network. End of the day, I want to focus on delivering the network, I mean, services for my customer. And we are right there by providing the, the commitment from our side is by we are investing in resources. We are going to commit the code back to the community as appropriate and when, whenever it makes sense. But we want to make sure that the networks are simple and we are able to innovate pretty quickly on top of it. Um, that's the final ask from me. And uh, again, uh, uh, this great partnership in this community, I mean, a lot of this stuff would not have been done without a lot of the contribution from uh, you guys here in this community. Again, we, thank, uh, we can't thank you enough on that, but there, we also see there's a lot of work left trying to, especially when you look at 5G, there's a lot of work left to, for us to accelerate and uh, make it interoperable. So thank you. And with that, uh, probably we'll take some questions here. Uh, well, yeah, thank you. I think we have some very limited time for questions, but one maybe. We have questions, very good. Yeah. <laughs> I like it, or no. Okay, so uh, I'll ask a question very quickly. Uh, okay. uh, fascinating progress. I know you, know you guys are leaders in this space and all that. Uh, give us a little bit of a timing. Uh, you know, there's, there's the marketing guys, you know, 5G is here and I can make a call. And then there is the engineers, which will be 2025. What is the reality? <laughs> Maybe I can start. Yeah. I think actually the core network and the orchestration solution, I think we're already more or less there today with these type of networks. I think we have to wait some time for the kind of a new radio, et cetera. But that's, I think from the core network perspective and the OSS, I think we are, I mean, we have closed feedback loop thinking today. We have that in our system. So. And 5G is here now. I yeah. mean, what we are relooking radio has worked uh, extremely well. We are progressing with the trials. And uh, I think what we are looking at is the opportunity to redo, redefine the core network as well in a way that it can scale and work with it. And it's, it's, uh, I think we are on the right path. And we'll get there pretty quickly. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Emil.